Thanks for joining us here at Christ Church, where we are one church meeting in multiple locations and reaching around the world thanks to what God is doing through Church Online. If you have any questions or want to learn more about us as a church, you can always check us out by simply going to ChristChurch.LA. We would love for you to stay connected throughout your week and everywhere you go through our Christ Church app. It's free and available wherever you download apps from. With all that being said, let's get into the service. Good morning, good morning, good morning to all of you. God bless you. Thank you for your passionate worship, for your faithful presence week after week. What a great day it is to serve the Lord and to be in God's house with God's people. Don't you love people around you? Don't you love the family of God? I mean, it's, it's amazing what the body of Christ means to us, and I'm really grateful to God for that. Really thankful uh, for what's happening in Ruston, Louisiana right now. Would you help me give a big shout out to our Ruston family, Pastor Jerry? Come on, give it up right now. We love you guys. We thank God for you, everybody viewing online from wherever you are around the world. We thank you for joining in with us, and we believe that God's going to speak a word to your heart today in Jesus' name. Well, we uh, started, we kicked off the series last Sunday that we're, we're calling uh, Ask Me Why. And so it started last week with, with our, our values, because we think values are important. And we, we're, we're taking some weeks out of our preaching season to talk to our church family and really just to clarify some of the values that we believe drive us into God's best for this church family. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 10, uh, hold that, and then turn to Matthew chapter 22. We'll look at some other scriptures uh, as well. Uh, We believe that being value-driven will have a huge impact on the preferred future that God has for us as a church. It's It's likely the key that brings this continuity, this everybody speaking the same thing, everybody believing the same, everybody understanding the same things. Uh, and expecting all the incredible things that God has in store for us as a community of believers. I, I don't know about you, but I want to be ready for God's next for us. Anybody else, you want to be ready for God's next in your life? I know, that, I know that's how you're living. I know that you're living your life in preparation for what God will do that will take you into your future. Uh, yes, we have to be thankful for all that God's done in the past. And I, I for one, am I'm so blessed by looking back over the years and remembering where we were and where God has brought us to. Thank God for his hand on the life of this church. I just talked to a lady in a funeral yesterday, and she was from out of town, and she said, I just feel, I feel the presence of God in this room. I never met her before, but she said, you can tell this is an anointed house just by walking in here, and, and uh, I thank God for that. I, I want to hang on. I want to hold on to that, don't you? I know that you do. And so we got to be thankful for what God's done in the past, but never assuming that what God has done is all that he wants to do. We can't get get in some mindset thinking, well, God's done it. It's all done. And now God's just going to camp out here and he doesn't have anything, uh, any more victories, no more ground to cover, no more territory to take. Um, God is not finished. I, I, for one, believe there is a divine plan. I believe there's a a plot. What's the, what's the catch word now if you turn on the news? It's, I think there's a collusion of sorts. I, I, think, I think there's a divine conspiracy. And what took 50 years this month, this church turns 50 years this month, what took 50 years to position this church to affect 2,600 people in five services on two campuses on Sunday morning and 1,000 more people joining us online, uh, I, I just believe from, I just believe what a local pastor, I sat at coffee with a local pastor, and this is what he said this week. He said, Tom, I believe God has positioned Christ Church. I believe God has positioned Christ Church in such a way that you could double your impact, not in 50 years, but in 50 weeks. Come on, anybody willing to link up faith with me today? I believe God has got us to where we are now, and God is not a small, limited God. Now, if it had to do with us and it was on our backs, then okay, all bets are off. But the reality is God can do more, exceedingly, abundantly more than you could ask, think, even dream or imagine God can do for who? himself, for his kingdom, that he may be glorified in the earth. So we have to prepare ourselves for the future that God has for us as a church. And at least part of that is intentionally refocusing on our values as a worshiping community. 
A huge part of that refocusing is shifting our attention back to an unreached harvest. People that are lost outside the walls of this church, we dare not get locked up in here and rock our way to glory and let the world go to hell in a handbasket. That's not who we are. That's not who we're called to be. We have to lift our hearts and our eyes to the world beyond the walls, the physical walls of, of these churches. The world around us is waiting for the one unchanging factor in life, the one and only hope that will not crumble beneath their feet, and that, my friends, is the love of Jesus Christ. How many of you are glad you've experienced God's love in your own life today? Last week I walked with you through our top value, Know God, passionately pursuing Jesus together. I won't re-preach that this morning, but it's, I think it's valuable enough for you to go find it on the web, either at cckristchurch.la or on uh, social media. Today I want to talk to you about our second most important value, and that is to love people, giving away love generously. The reason we value knowing God and loving people as our two top priorities and two highest values that we have is really because they're mandated by Scripture. You, you, you recognize these two uh, values as the great commandment. Matthew 22, you're there. Verse 35, let me share this with you. One of them, an expert in the law, Matthew 22, verse 35 One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap Jesus with this question. Now, they were always trying to catch Jesus. They they wanted to set a tripwire for him. They wanted to trap him in his words. They wanted to get him off track and make him say something he didn't mean to say. Teacher, he said, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied in verse 37, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. There's a whole bunch of people who would love for Jesus just to stop right there, man. Just stop. You, you're doing good. Don't mess it up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the greatest commandment, period. Close the book. But he didn't. He went on to say this, verse 39. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. I I think at first glance, I I think I would say I'm pretty good at this second value, loving people. But then when I I really started looking at myself introspectively, I, I realized that I'm actually better at this in my mind than I am in reality. I think, I, think, uh, I think more highly of myself, as the Scripture says, don't do it, than we ought to think. Trina and I were fairly young in ministry. I mean, I'm talking back 25 years ago. We've been here at Christ Church 31 years. I was bivocational. God bless all the bivocational pastors. There are a lot of them, and they're doing their best to forward the kingdom of God. I was bivocational and working at the Washtenaw Parish Fire Department and pastoring the church as well. And the church had begun a wonderful season of growth. We had demolished the old brick building where CC Kids stands, and we were meeting in the building, the metal building out here where our Spanish church is meeting today. Um, we were doing that while we were constructing the, the kids' space now. There was a family that was working intricately alongside us. They were diligent. They were working hard, and they were pushing the kingdom forward, holding Bible studies in their homes, small groups, and uh, they become dear to us, this, this man and woman, and and personally alive in ministry. And over the course of the years, we were all just neck deep in ministry. This couple made an appointment to come to our home and pray over us. And they had it all planned out. They served as communion in our living room. And after the communion and prayer time, they they brought out a basin of water and there washed our feet, pledged their lives and their service and their allegiance to us and to the kingdom of God at Christ Church. And uh, I want to tell you, it was, we were frankly blown away by their pledge and their generosity and their grace. Trina and I went to bed that night just warmed by the Spirit of God. It was a, an amazing time uh, that we felt. And fast forward about four weeks, four weeks later, it seemed like I'd barely gotten the water between my toes after that foot washing experience dried out. It was a short period of time. Four weeks later, I got the news that this same couple who had just served us communion, washed feet with us, and pledged their lives to serving us, 
had been working secretly behind the scenes and had about 22 or 23 families ready to leave Christ Church and go start another church. <clears throat> I was totally devastated. I think it was more of the betrayal than it was the, the departure of those people. As a matter of fact, I scheduled meetings after meetings after meetings, met with every family who would meet with me, and, and 23 people, 23 families departing turned into two families departing. And the rest of them were salvaged. I'll tell you that to say this, sometimes it's hard to demonstrate the love of Jesus to the people that are very near to us that become difficult in our lives. It's not always an easy proposition <clears throat> to do what Jesus said, bless those who curse you. Say all men are evil against you falsely. It's not always easy to, but you want to bless them all right. Yeah, Lord, bless them good, Lord. Bless them, bless them upside the head with a brick, Jesus. Just <laughs> knock them out, Lord. Come on. Don't leave me up here by myself. You know you've been there. You prayed prayers very similar to that. Of course you have. You're human. <clears throat> but listen, the thing that Jesus came to this earth to tell us is that he loves them as much as he loves us. Listen to this. If you're taking notes, jot this down. We're all tied for first where God's love is concerned. We're all tied for first. Don't tell me about your service to God. Yes, he loves you, but you're doing what you're called to do, what you're appointed to do, what you're saved to do. But the love of God extends beyond the house of God and the people of God to the guy who went to sleep in a ditch drunk last night. Okay. I see right now we're not going to give very many amens this morning because we got some more of this coming. So either buckle up, say amen, oh me, suck them toes under the seats, whatever you need to do. We're just going to break it down to where we live today, folks. You all right with that? In Jesus' name. <clears throat> In our natural way of thinking, it's hard to believe Jesus could love those difficult people, people so different from us at Christ Church, people that are difficult, evil people, the murderer, the child molester. What? The child molester? You mean the people that passed the abortion bill in New York City? He, he loves them too? You got to be, that can't be right. I'm missing, say, so yeah, we're, we're not connecting all the dots here. I want to get the message across really well. So if you've drifted off just for a few, few seconds, just come right back here for a moment. When we quote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, we could probably, every one of us quote it. That doesn't mean just some special people, salt of the earth, kind of patriotic folk. It's not just, it doesn't mean just some really kind of God-fearing people. For God so loved the world means every person on the planet. It means the Satanists out there on the shores of Cali somewhere, holding some seance, offering up a pig to worship Satan. God loves them. We're all tied for first where the love of God is concerned. You mean every person, every person on the planet, the human trafficker, yes. The pedophile, yes. The common thief, absolutely. Does it make their sins right somehow? No, it just means that the love of God wants to rescue them and reach them with the pit they're living in and drag them out and set them on these seats on a Sunday morning with their lives cleansed and their heart turned on to Jesus and their sins forgiven and their hands thrown up in the air giving praise and glory to God. God loves every person. Same way Jesus died for you and me, he died for them. The Democrats, the Republicans, these people protesting at a U.S. soldier's funeral in the name of Jesus with a, with a sign that says some Baptist, off-brand Baptist church, shouting down at the people can't even lay their loved one to rest. He died for the skinhead Nazi groups, the LGBTQ. I don't say that often enough. Maybe I ought to say it more. The LGBT community, again, we're all tied for first place in the mind of Jesus. And before we get all puffed up and high, lifted up in our righteousness and look down our nose at others, you know, they used to look, the, the, the Pharisees, they, they wouldn't refer to Jesus as his name. He said, this man, it was a way of talking down. This man did this or this man. How often are we guilty of those people? 
Oh, wait a minute. Those people, by the way, are the ones that Jesus was hung up for. He loves us all. There are people in your life right now that cause you headaches. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's a neighbor who blows their leaves into your yard. Yeah. Maybe it's a neighbor who's having trouble with you who blow your leaves into their yard. Maybe it's a coworker, a family member causing you headaches. As difficult as they may be, Jesus has called you to give away love generously to them. I believe that if you're here today, it's because you want to be more like Jesus. And Jesus said, if you want to be like me, you have to love your neighbors and pray for your enemies. <clears throat> I know that's a stretch, folks. I know that's not what we talk about every week. We'd way rather talk about the blessings of God overtaking us. Let me just get down to where Christianity really is. Christianity is loving God, knowing God, passionately pursuing Jesus, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, giving away love generously, giving it away, giving love away. Let's look back at what Jesus said. It's a story you probably are very familiar with out of Luke's gospel, the 10th chapter. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10, we'll pick up with verse number 25. <clears throat> One day an expert in religious law stood up, here we go again, stood up to test Jesus by asking him a question again, this trap, trying to trap him. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, verse 26, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. The man wanting to justify his actions said to Jesus, well, uh, who, who is my neighbor? Let's get this straight. Tell me who is my neighbor. Jesus gives this parable of the Good Samaritan and replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead on the right side of the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he just got on the other side of the street. Got no time for this. Can't get, I'm, I got my Sunday go to meet and clothes on. I just had my manicure. I don't want to get blood and dirt all up in my nails. So he crossed on the side of the road. A temple assistant walked over, looked at the man lying there. Is he breathing? I don't think he's even breathing. But he also said, you know what, somebody will probably help him. He passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan, this is a Jewish man who despised the Samaritan people. A despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged. He took it. You know what he did? He took, he took his, uh, he, he took it, what's the little shirt with a horsey on it? What's that? What kind of shirt is that? Polo. He took his polo shirt off. Thank God he had a wife beater shirt on and under it. Forgive me for that. He took his polo shirt off, ripped it to shreds, and bound it around the man's wounds and his head where he was bleeding. He poured in oil and wine, patched this man up. Poured in oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper Two silver coins telling him, it would be like handing him your MasterCard, your Visa. Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these, Jesus said, would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. If you grew up in or around church, you've heard this story over and over. It's so familiar to us that many times I think we're just uh, tempted to agree with Jesus, just move on, let's just move on. But the fact is, Jesus doesn't just want us to agree with him. I don't believe any of us could think of a time where Jesus gathered all his disciples around and said, hey, now, let's just all, y'all, y'all, y'all act right and y'all just agree with what I'm saying. That's not what happened. He wants us to do what he says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? If you love me, keep my 
commandments. He wants to follow his instructions. And he said, and he, said he wants us to, to love people, the people that he died to save from their sin. In this parable, three different types of people that came in contact with this Jewish man. I want to break it down to us. The thieves, they saw the Jewish man as a victim to exploit. They didn't view this man as a fellow human being. They didn't care about his needs. They didn't care about him at all. All they wanted to do is take advantage of him, rob him of anything that was of value, and left him on the side of the road half dead. It's safe to say these kind of people are in our society today. Number two, there were some religious men, priests and the Levite. Two of them, they saw the injured man, yet they viewed him as a nuisance. God forgive us. They viewed him as a nuisance to be avoided. Just someone to be avoided. Maybe they thought their service to God was fulfilled for that day already. They attended worship and dropped their tithe in the basket or the temple tax. Maybe they saw no obligation to help this man in need because they personally didn't do anything to put him there. They might have said, well, dude shouldn't have been traveling alone by himself on this Jericho Road. I mean, anybody knows that. Are we guilty of that? You see somebody in a, in a sad situation or a terrible plight, and we say, well, look what they did to get there. I mean, you can't help people like that. Everybody smile at me right now. Maybe they were thinking, I don't have time for this. It's none of my business. I can't stop and help every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Someone else will help him. Whatever they were thinking, they avoided coming into contact with the man and passed to the other side of the road. They dissolved, absolved themselves. They absolved themselves from the responsibility to act. But there was this third man, which Luke 10.33 identifies simply as a despised Samaritan. A man who saw an opportunity to help another person in need. And even though there was a ton of tension between the Samaritans and the Jews, if you know the history, the Jews, they, they, they hated these Samaritans. They were half-breed. They were Jews who were inbred with other nations. And they despised them. They weren't full-blooded Jews. They would walk around, all the way around Samaria, when it had been point A, the quickest point from point quickest route from point A to point B is just a straight line, but they'd take this big jaunt way out here so they didn't get that filthy Samaritan dirt between their toes. They hated the Samaritans. This man knew the bleeding man hated him. And though he hated him and saw him as less than a dog, he was about to help him. Matter of fact, Jesus would have done this kind of thing. The Samaritan made no excuses. He had no ulterior motives. And he simply did what he could do to help this dying man, this person in need. I think this story is a favorite told over and over again because it defies our assumptions. It it shatters our preconceived notions and it expands our thinking and understanding of who our neighbor actually is. Because you see what Jesus said wants this lawyer to know, what he wants the crowd to know, what he wants us to realize this morning is the kingdom of God is an act, A-C-T, an act. It's an act of love. It's an act of compassion. One act of love leading to another act of compassion, leading to another act of mercy, leading to another act of generosity. The kingdom of God is an act. It's an act of forgiveness. and It's an act of compassion. The kingdom of God is an action we live out day in and day out. That's why our second most important value is to love people, giving away love generously. Not because somebody measured up or did something to bless us or reached some level of perfection before we said, hey, let me be a blessing to your life. Let me come alongside you. Let me help you. I know you smell like alcohol every time I'm near you, but I'm going to walk with you through this and get you to the other side of your journey. God's got big plans for your life. It's an act of love, an act of compassion. There's a book that we have some copies of in, at both campuses, really two books out there by Bob Goff. One, the adult version is Everybody Always. I brought it to the pulpit with me. And there's another 
a child version of this very beautiful for your children to instill in them the thoughts of other people and how they can be a blessing to others. I'd encourage you to read this, Everybody Always, by Bob Goff. Let me, let me just share part of the, the prologue with you this morning. He said, I spent my whole life trying to make my faith easy. The truth is, it's not. From what I've been reading, if we do it right, we'll actually kill, it will actually kill all the all earlier versions of us. What I'm trying to do now is make my faith simple. Not easy, but simple. This book is dedicated to everyone who's helped my, me and my friends make their faith increasingly simple. These people haven't tried to save up love like they're going to need it later. They know we're rivers, not reservoirs. Wow. Man, I read that. I'm telling you, I got emotional just reading this first little paragraph. They know we're rivers, not reservoirs. We're not supposed to hold up a bunch of love, hoping that one day maybe there'll come a time when we can dis dispense it. No, we're dispensers of the love of Jesus every day of our life. You use what you got, God fills you back up so you can use it some more. It's a, it's a, a reciprocal action of heaven in our lives. We don't need to be who we used to be. God sees who we're becoming, and we're becoming, the author says, we're becoming love. Jesus said, love one another. What is simple often isn't easy, and what is easy often doesn't last. My goodness. Love isn't something we fall into. Love is something we become. Love is loving each other is what we were meant to do. Remember, the second commandment is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's not just people that we like or with whom we have things in common. It's easy for me to love my wife. It's easy for me to love my kids. But when we are loving the neighbors that we don't understand or even know, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of humility. But they're worth it because they are a, an eternal soul with an eternal destination. And choose any of the most controversial social issues of our day, and what you'll find is that there are people on all sides who are passionate about their point of view. Come on, we see that, don't we? We know what it's about. Uh, listen, listen to this quote from th this book, Everybody Always. He says, here's the sad fact. Many of us have lost our way trying to help others find theirs. Arguments won't change people. Simply giving away kindness won't either. Only Jesus has the power to change people, and it will be harder for them to see Jesus if their view of him is blocked by our big opinions. Listen, I think the church has devolved into this, this uh, the, the whole drumbeat, come out from among them and be ye separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate. I believe that. I believe we're, we are of the world, we're not of the world. But I want to tell you, we, we, can get the, we can get this them versus us mentality. It's not a them versus us. It's all of us versus the devil and hell and his imps and everything that wants to destroy the lives of people that we love. It's not about, hey, let's put thumbs down on everybody who doesn't dress like us, look like us, talk like us, smell like us, wear a jack-in-the-pocket tuck on Sunday morning. Help us, God, to reach beyond the, 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 the barriers that we have artificially set up and into the darkness that the reason that we're still here on this planet, the only reason that I can come up with why the Lord hadn't rescued his church is because there's still unsaved people that don't know Jesus and he's hoping that you and I will be his vessels to reach the lost world around us. People need to experience the power of Jesus' love, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. God, help us be the air that points people to him, not the barricade that keeps them from him. Jesus didn't say that we'd identify ourselves by what we believed or by the, all the great things we hoped to do for him one day. Jesus said we'd be identified be, that we belong to him simply by, by how we love other people. How's the world around you know who you are? How are you loving other people? I'm asking myself the same question, folks. It's not a one-way conversation. I'm talking to myself this morning. How am I loving other people that are different from me? 
Listen carefully. Only Jesus has the power to change people. We might be known for our strong opinions, but we will be remembered by the depth of our love. That you loved without precondition. Without, you loved even though you knew somebody wasn't going to convert. That you loved even when they were the roughest, most foul-mouthed person in the office, you loved anyway. They knew who you are. They know who you are. You're Christ Christ's father. They know you, and yet you loved anyway. And ultimately, I want to tell you, one plants, that's a little seed planted. Somebody else comes along three or four years later, puts some water on that seed, another encounter, a, a circumstance that's bigger than them, some terrible thing come up in their family, and all of a sudden, what they've been believing won't hold water. Now they're thinking, hey, man, I remember what that guy said at the lunch table that day. Maybe I ought to investigate the claims of Christ. As followers of Christ, we can't fall in the trap of avoiding people we don't understand, the people who are different from us, the people who don't look like us, dress like us, have the same political views as us, or the people who don't yet believe in Jesus. We can't fall in the trap of avoiding people that Jesus came and gave his entire ministry and then gave his life to save. I often am sitting in traffic, maybe on Louisville Avenue, and see people at 5 o'clock. Maybe a young woman with a baby in the back seat, in the car seat, or a guy in a construction truck. And the thought often runs through my mind. I wonder if those people are on their way to heaven. Do they know Jesus? As messy and as uncomfortable and as difficult as it might be, when we put the great commission, commission, commandment into action, loving God with all our heart and loving our neighbors ourselves, it's extremely powerful. Let me, let me break this down as I'm moving toward a close. Break this Samaritan's actions down. Three practical points. Number one, he was moved with compassion. What's your compassion quotient? What's your compassion quotient? Compassion, that feeling that rises up inside of you when you're confronted with another person's suffering and feel motivated to help relieve the suffering. The Bible says that Jesus saw the multitudes as sheep not having a shepherd. He was moved. He was moved with compassion for them. Are you ever moved with compassion? It's not the same as empathy, even though they're, they're cousins. Empathy refers more to the ability to feel the pain of another person. Compassion is when those feelings and thoughts include a desire to reach out beyond yourself and help alleviate the pain. Every single day, we need to pray that God will give us more compassion. We need to pray that our hearts would break for what breaks his heart. What breaks the heart of God? People who are oppressed, people who are broken, people who are marginalized in our society, people who are empty, people who are destitute, people who don't know Jesus. God, help us never see a need and simply choose, make a conscious choice, see a need and just make a choice. I'm going to move on this other side of the road because I don't have time. Somebody else will handle it. The Samaritan was moved with compassion. Number two, he made contact. He refused to allow this Jewish man to stay in his dying condition. I'll just be honest with you. This is where it gets a little messy. This is where you get some blood on you, kind of germy. When, when you pull that person in need alongside you and commit to being a blessing, a mentor, to love them to hope, to love them to faith, to love them to healing. When you get close, you can see their need better and then respond appropriately. But it's a little messy. Sadly, there, the, there are some excuses as Christians as to why we can't help. And we've said things like, well, I'm not healthy enough myself to help anybody else. I'm trying to work through my own issues. Here's a common excuse. I just don't have time to get tied up with all that. How many times has it been true the health and healing that you need for your own life is to be found when you're helping someone else in need. I've said it plenty of times from this pulpit. You're asking God for a desperate need to be answered in your life. Get busy finding a need worse than yours. Help some, you be the answer to somebody else's need, and God will backdoor you with the answer to your own life. Yes, he will. It doesn't take a lot to love people. You just got to be willing to get a little dirt on you. Here's the third thing. It cost him something. Your ministry is someone that cost you nothing most likely won't accomplish anything of lasting value. you got to put some skin in the game. Loving people has a price. It may cost you your time, your energy, maybe even 
some of your precious resources. But it's our job. It's always been our job as believers. We're just supposed to love the next person right in front of us. We have a responsibility to tell the world about the love of Jesus Christ, not pointing a finger of condemnation at them, not wagging our finger and looking down our righteous religious nose from some holy perch. <clears throat> no walking by on the other side, oh, you shouldn't have been out here by yourself, pal. Look at you. I mean, come on, man. Use your head. You'll, you'll learn a lesson by this and keep going. That's not what we're called to do. Loving them without an agenda is what we're called to do. Write this down. People don't grow where they are informed. People don't grow where they are informed. They grow where they are loved and accepted. Our church is going to be a the display of the heart of God. We're going to have to love the world and every single person in it. The people we don't understand. The people that don't believe the same as us. The people that annoy us. And yes, even the people who hate us. I want people who meet you and me to feel like they've just met someone who came out of the presence of Jesus Christ. Let me close with this. I want to read the, the last two paragraphs from this book. If you want to become love, stop just agreeing with Jesus. Go call someone right now. Well, after the service is over, okay? <laughs> call someone. Lift them up in ways they can't lift themselves. Send them a text message and say you're sorry. I know they don't deserve it. You didn't either. Don't put a toe in the water with your love. Grab your knees and do a cannonball. Move from the bleachers to the field and you won't ever be the same. Don't just love the people who are easy to love. Go love the difficult ones. If you do this, Jesus says you'll move forward on your journey toward being more like him. Equally important, as you practice loving everybody always, what will happen along the way is you'll no longer be who you used to be. God will turn you into love. God will turn you into love. <laughs> I value. Love others. Give love away generously. Give love away generously and God will turn you into the personification of love. In Jesus' name. Come on, you receive the word of the Lord this morning. Put your hands together. As a church, it's our honor to play a small part in what God's doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out what your next steps could be in your relationship with Christ, all you have to do is go to Christchurch.la slash next. Here at Christ Church, our mission is to see people connected, restored, and empowered through the love of Jesus Christ. And that statement drives everything that we do as a church. All because we know and we believe whoever finds God finds life. I hope you've been encouraged by the message today. We know that the Word of God is alive and that Jesus is ministering to you right where you are right now. You see, He sent His Holy Spirit to move us, to comfort us, and to challenge us to love God with all of our hearts, to be loved on by God, and to love the world as we love ourselves. So today I ask you, wherever you are watching from, why don't you close your eyes and bow your head? You see, maybe you're viewing online today and you've never placed your trust in Jesus' Lordship. You see, He's coming for you. He wants you and He wants for you to know this free gift of salvation. And so the scripture teaches us that if we would confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, if we would believe in our hearts that the Father raised Him from the dead, that we enter into this salvation, which is eternal life. Maybe you've never done that before. And today you want to become a Jesus follower. You know what? Today is your day. Why don't you repeat this prayer with me? Say it out loud. I pray to you, Lord Jesus, today I put my trust in you. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. And I trust that the life that you lived and the death that you died was enough for me. 
was enough for my salvation. I turn to you in faith, believing that you are for me and you're not against me. I am forever yours and you are forever mine. Thank you for this free gift of eternal life. It's in your holy name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. I want you to know that if you said that prayer and you have put your trust in the saving work of Jesus, that all of heaven is celebrating you today and we celebrate with you. Let us know if this is the first time that you have entered into saving faith with him. Let us know what's going on in your life. We would love to put a book in the mail to encourage you and to help equip you and to, to really build this foundation of who you are in Christ Jesus. This is just the beginning of knowing his saving grace. It's been a great day with you. Thanks for tuning in. If you need prayer for anything, spiritual, financial, physical, emotional, would you comment here and let us know? We would love to be able to pray for you each and every week. Our staff prays over the prayer needs. We're standing with you in prayer today. If this service has made an impact in your life, we would ask you to partner with us. There's a couple ways that you can do that. Number one, share this video on whichever social platform that you're on. Share it and let other people know about this beautiful news of who Jesus is for us. And number two, consider partnering with us in your giving and help us continue spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ through this region and into the entire world. Once again, thank you for joining with us today. God bless you.